There are unseen forces all around us making possible things that would seem like magic to humans centuries ago. It's nothing mystical, it's electromagnetism. And from the simple compass to the GPS systems that make satellites possible, it keeps a steady hand on our planet. And yet, as science journalist Alana Mitchell demonstrates in her new book, these forces aren't as stable as we think. And that could really spell trouble. She lays it out in The Spinning Magnet, the force that created the modern world and could destroy it. And we're pleased it brings Alana Mitchell to our studio tonight. Welcome. Thank you. It kind of sounds dire, doesn't it? I know, it? I know. It sounds like science fiction. <laughs> it, it, it really does sound yeah. like fiction, um, science fiction. Where did you get the idea for this book? Oh, well, you know what? I, I wrote a book about the find of Sir John Franklin's lost ship, the HMS Erebus. And, and as I did the research for that book, this was a couple of years ago, and as I did the research for that book, I learned that part of his quest was not just to, to complete the Northwest Passage, it was also that he was part of something called the Magnetic Crusade, which went on for hundreds of years and sort of peaked in the 18. And it's something that not many of us have heard of. I, I had never heard of this. I just, I had no idea that it even existed. But it was this fantastic, the first real international scientific collaboration and scientists were trying to figure out the properties of the magnetic field so that they could navigate. And he was part of that. And so I got thinking about why, you know, what is this magnetic field and why was it so, uh, so tricky, so protean? Because that particular voyage, um, it ended up in disaster, right? It ended in disaster, yeah. yeah. He, all 129 men died and the two ships were just found a couple of years ago. So it was this grand scientific and expeditionary, you know, Arctic mystery for a long time. So I, I got writing about that and writing about the Magnetic Crusade just as, a, as part of this book on Franklin. And you were watching the Aurora Borealis. And then I was up in the Arctic. Yeah, yeah I was up in the Arctic on the, the island where he, you know, he had his crew died, um, which is called King William Island, up in the, just above the, the Canadian mainland. And I was up there doing some research and I got out of my tent one night and there with the Aurora Borealis. And I thought, how does this all connect? How does the Aurora Borealis connect with the Magnetic Crusade? How does that connect with the compass? How does it, how does it all work? And I just got launched. And did you find out what, how it was all connected? <laughs> well, y yes, I guess. I mean, the Aurora Borealis happened because there, it, it basically it's, it's, it's a dance between our Earth's magnetic field and the universe's magnetic field. They interact, really it's the sun's magnetic field. They interact and it makes all these, these little um, particles in the atmosphere dance and that's what causes the lights and they, they crackle and they, they, they wave through, through the, it's, it's really one of the very few places that we can see the magnetic field. So I was learning about all this um, very, uh, you know, it was, it was deep, a deep dive for me and one of the things I had to learn about was quantum field theory to understand how magnetic theory works and so, and so really as I did that I realized within the core of the earth is this big sort of molten metallic uh, ocean you know in effect and it's and there's all this movement within it it's heat being con conducted away from this the core and away into out into you know the, the the crust of the planet and as this heat moves it creates electrical currents which creates this massive magnetic field and you can see there that it the, the part that's facing toward the sun is buffeted by all the solar wind and it's um and it, it sort of presses up against the against the the planet our planet the part that faces toward the sun is gets pressed up and then this this great huge long um other expansive it sort of streams out toward the back away from the sun so there's this great field uh, it's like a uh, scientists often describe it as like a cocoon or a shield that protects us from that solar wind, but also from other galactic radiation that is coming in. So it's, it's our, it, it, the scientists don't call it the prerequisite for life on Earth, but they think that it's one of the things that allows life to exist. And then it turns out that, and this is the part that blew my mind. I mean, I'm, I'm, these are new concepts for me as, as I'm starting to research this book. I have never heard about any of this stuff. I'm just, I'm a complete novice. But of course, what I do is call up scientists and they explain things to me. And so what one of them said to me is that, that our planet is, is like a giant magnet with two poles, North Pole and the South Pole. And every now and again, those poles switch places. And as she mind was, blown. Mind blown. She yeah. was explaining this to me and I thought, you know, if this is true, it's just a fantastic story. And I just have to understand 
not only that it's happening, but why? Why does this happen? And so I just started researching. And so I ended up finding the scientist who first wrote the first paper about the fact that the poles had at one other time been on opposite sides of the earth from where they were in 1905 when he discovered this. And so I, I, and he lived in France. And so I decided to just go to France and see if I could do his journey over. And before we talk about that uh, <laughs> scientist, uh, can you show us, uh, you have something in your, you I have, have some magnets. I have some magnets. And so these are probably what we would call today magnetite or what people used to call lodestone and, and they're naturally occurring magnets. They, they have been dug up from the crust of the earth. They're very unusual because most material is not magnetic. Usually it's, it, everything's in balance. But in these particular ones, these magnets are creating, these, these rocks are creating their own magnetic fields. And so what you've got is each one of these individual magnets has a north and a south pole and they fit together in a certain way. So a north has to fit with a south, and a south has to fit with a north. So not north, north, and not south, south. So if you try, so if you go like this, you're putting norths and souths together. But if you're going like this, you're trying to put two norths or two souths together, and you can't. Like I'm trying as hard as I can here, and I cannot make these go the, because there is this, and that is the electromagnetic force that is one of the fundamental forces of the universe, and it's it's the thing that holds everything together on the planet. And you can see how strong it is just from these little tiny yeah. magnets. Those are small. These are tiny. Yeah. So that, when you're playing with these, you are playing with the electromagnetic for magnetic force that is part of what makes up the whole universe. Well, I want to read a passage from your book okay. um, where you write about explorer James Clark Ross and who first pinpointed the magnetic North Pole in 1831. Yep. You write, his discovery of it was part of the magnetic crusade the most sustained and impassioned scientific campaign the world had seen until then. At that time, the might of nations depended on naval prowess and efficient trade on the seas, and that depended on the magnetic compass. There was a trick to seafaring navigation, though. Knowing where you were depended on being able to adjust for the difference between magnetic north, where the compass pointed, and geographical north. The scientific world was united in an obsessive effort to figure out a formula that would allow sailors to know their coordinates more exactly. That required understanding the strange force that pulled the compass, and that demanded information from the top and bottom of the earth where the force showed itself most strongly. How did our ancestors harness magnetic power to invent the compass? Well, they just, they, they had things like this, lodestones, and they just, what they do, what they did was just um, you can use a lodestone to magnetize, a, say, a needle or a piece of a little piece of iron temporarily. So you can rub this one of these lodestones across um, a, a needle and temporarily magnetize it. And so if you if you then float that in something, it, it will point. It will not gravitate. It will point north toward the North Pole. And they had to do this because before they depended on longitude and latitude, right? This is part of longitude and latitude. Mm -hmm. So you can, tell your, you can tell your coordinates as you sail, because it was all about the age of sail. Mm -hmm. um, people had to know where they were, you know, where a ship was uh, and where it was going to be later on. So, so as they tried to navigate across the ocean, and all of a sudden, instead of just, just being able to you know, hug the coasts or sound the bottom of the ocean, they were out in the open ocean where it was deep and they couldn't, they couldn't do it's that. It was unpredictable. It was unpredictable, and so what they were trying to do was they could navigate by the stars when the stars were out, and they could navigate by the by the land when they could see the land. But when they were out in the open ocean and it was cloudy, and they needed to know more, more precisely where they were, what they needed to do was they, they had a compass that pointed toward magnetic north, and they could they could always tell where geographic north was by where the sun rose and set. What's the difference? Um, well, that's variable. It's incredibly variable. And, and the difference between those two is an angle, and it's called declination. And, and the great quest for hundreds and hundreds of years was to try, try to figure out what the declination was. I'm going to leave everybody in suspense for a few more <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and we're going to go backwards. Um, okay. And you mentioned the first person who came up with this, um, that there was a North and a South Pole, and they moved. And that was Petrus Peregrinus? Well, Petrus Peregrinus was the first one who realized that magnets have a North and South Pole, so okay. it, th that a magnet like this one has, has, has a direction. So there's, there's a force fields coming from this, this magnet, and it's, it's 
there are all these lines of force that are running around like 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 a like like a ring like a ring through the center mm -hmm. here so it's being generated within this and it's it's running around in rings so there's a whole bunch of waves you could say lines of force that are running outside of this magnet and how significant was that discovery that was huge and he he discovered not only that th that there was a north and a south pole to this thing but that no matter how small you cut a magnet, it always has a north and a south pole. And this was revolutionary because until Petrus Peregrinus, who did his experiments in, well, he wrote about it in 1269, until he did that, people thought that magnets were kind of transitory. They thought they were magical. They thought that they were maybe a devilish kind of thing because it was about attraction and, you know, it might be kind of sinful. They weren't even people sure. People actually thought that they could like cure stab wounds or if yeah. a woman cheated on her husband, yeah. it could make her not there do were, it. There were, there were all magnet, you know, all sorts of magical properties that they attributed to magnets, but they thought that magnets were not a permanent thing. They thought that they could be, that they could come and go and come and go. What Peregrinus figured out in some experiments he did in 1269 was that they are a constant force. And so he, he, he called it a natural instinct. He, he said that they, they always were like that and that they had properties. And he did experiments to show this. And this was totally revolutionary. They're the first experiments cataloged in the history of science. Now, at the time, were, was his result, were his results uh, accepted? Or did people have pushback a little bit? There wasn't so much pushback. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was... You know, he was considered an early scientist. It's not like everybody read this thing either. It's, you know, it's the Middle Ages. So uh, there were just, that we have a few uh, left of his documents. But more, the most important thing that happened was that his document was read in 1600 by another scientist. Bernard Brun? He was William Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> There's he another. came before. He came before, okay. and William Gilbert did a whole bunch of experiments. He was a, he was a physician. He was a physician to uh, Queen Elizabeth I, in fact, and he wrote a big treatise in 1600 that talked about the magnet and what the magnet was. And what he discovered, and this was revolutionary too, um, after having read Peregrinus, he discovered that the Earth itself is a magnet, and this was. Not just that there are little magnetic properties, little lodestones all over the place that are magnetic, but that the Earth itself is a magnet. And this was just, it changed. I'm guessing at that time, too, because religion uh, played such a big yeah. role in how people thought about everything. Yeah. Um, and then to say, actually, this is not what the book says, how was uh, that uh, this, discovery received? It was It was not as controversial in England as it was in Italy. So one of the proofs against Galileo, one of the things that Galileo was you know, convicted by the church for was having read William Gilbert's book on, in 1600. And so there are all sorts of examples of Gilbert's book that have the, you know, bits of it cut out because all of this stuff talks about the origin of the, you know, the, the, the species on the planet. It talks about how our planet was created. They didn't know that then, but that's ultimately where it all, you know, where it all led. They were talking about things that weren't in the Bible. And at that time, the Bible was the geological textbook, the only one. So nothing that humans observed, like, you know, the fact that the earth revolves around the sun, that was really, that was heresy at that time. And then another important individual is Bernard Brun. <laughs> Bernard I skipped Brun. ahead. <laughs> Bernard Brun. So in 1905, Bernard Brun is a, is a geophysicist. He lives in Clermont-Ferrand, which is in the middle of France, in the volcanic heart of France. And he's, he, he's, you know, doing a whole bunch of real new wave physics at that point. And one of the things he decides to do is try to see, try to help in this, in this, this, this quest of scientists at that time to try to reconstruct the past um, magnetic field of the, of the planet. This was something that scientists all over Europe were trying to do how at do that you time. Do this? And how do you do this? So yeah. what you do is you, you try to go into the crust, so which is the record of, uh, of the field, and, and see what's there. And so what he wanted to do was to find um, a, particular, a, a particular geological formation. He wanted to find a, a seam of terracotta, terracotta, which of course has iron in it. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to see terracotta that was, had been overlain with lava. From a volcano, and and the the reason was that as terracotta cools, so it's heated up by the lava, then it cools down. As it cools down, it becomes a sort of a fossil compass, locked in. It locks in the coordinates of the magnetic field of that time when it cooled, 
It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's just like this is all. And so he wanted to find that formation. And he, so he found one. Somebody cut a road and said, you know what, Bernard Brun, there's, there's, a, there's a cut, you know, an, a, a day's ride by, by horse from where you are here in central France. Go look at it. So he goes to look at it. He chisels out a, a couple of pieces of it, takes it back to his lab. And he discovers when he looks at it that the, 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 the coordinates locked into this piece of terracotta show clearly that the poles were on the opposite sides of the planet from where they were in 1905 when he chipped this thing out of the road. And so that, and then he wrote a paper about it. And this is where my research started, because I went and, you know, traveled along, you know, I, I tried to reconstruct his his journey along with... And you were with a fellow who... I was with a, a wonderful physicist, mm -hmm. a geophysicist, whose name is Jacques Kornprobst, mm -hmm. and he's an expert on uh, the mantle, and, you know, he well, he's, he's a... He, He's an expert on all things inner earth, in effect. And so he said to me, yes, come to France and I will take you and we will find where, you know, the road cut where Bernard Brun hacked this piece out of the terracotta. And so we went on this long journey, showed me all sorts of, um, you know, where Brun had lived. He showed me where he studied. He showed me, you know, we went on this quite long and complex journey to find the actual road cut where Bernard Brun had you know, hack this piece out of the road in mm -hmm. 1905. It also struck me that this individual cared so much about the legacy yeah. um, that he, if, without him, we might not even know what you have in the book. No, he was he was incredible. Jacques Cornprobst was was extraordinary. He spent days with me, just just sh explaining the science to me, taking me around and showing me, you know, what Brune had had done. The thing with Brune was, you see, it was it was a moment. It was a you could say a hinge moment. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing was the same after Brune wrote this paper saying that at one time. The poles had been on other, on the opposite sides of the planet, and it changed everything forever, because nobody could figure out why. They had no model. They had no way of understanding what would happen to make that possible. They just it was it it was it spoke of an anarchy within the center of the Earth that they had no way of explaining. Now, this has happened before in the past where the poles switch. It turns out that now we know, um, you know, more than 100 years later, that in fact, the poles have, they flip pl places, scientists say, aperiodically, so they can't predict exactly when, but every now and again, they, they switch places. And what happens when they switch? So when they switch places, the shield, that big shield that we saw earlier in that animation that's protecting us from all the solar wind and galactic radiation, that shield diminishes to about 10% of its usual strength for the whole time that the, that the poles are switching places. And that means we're exposed to more uh, solar and galactic damaging rays. The last one occurred, the last switch occurred 780,000 years ago? 780,000 years ago. Um, do we know when the next one could happen? That's the big puzzle. That's the great puzzle. So this is one of the things that scientists have been, have been trying to figure out because it would be good to know. Exactly, so we can plan. So we can plan. <laughs> but in the book you wrote that um, the switch happened every 200 to 300,000 years. So for the last 65 million years, it's been a period of you know, fairly rapid uh, reversals. They call it reversals because what's happening is the direction of the field is changing. So the, the reversals have happened um, roughly every 200 to, uh, 250 to 300,000 years. So the last one, on our planet was 780,000 years ago. So there are a lot of scientists who say, you know what, we're due. <laughs> right. And then they look at this tremendous turbulence and there are, there's evidence now from satellite imagery of, of the extreme turbulence, that, that movement of the North Pole was one, was one piece of that. There are other indicators that there's, there's really a lot of volatility, more than scientists are, you know, are used to within the core that, that is creating our magnetic field. So worst case scenario, if they do switch, what could happen? Um, well, they will switch at some point. The question is when, but they, they will switch. There seems to be no doubt about that. And the thing that scientists are most worried about is how immediately, the thing that they're most worried about is how that will affect all this electronic, electric infrastructure that we've built. Because these are, uh, the electric infrastructure we've built is conductor, is, is our, the, it's all metal, right? right? It's all conductive of electricity. And so when you have these, these big solar storms that might penetrate further into the atmosphere of the Earth, if we don't have a shield protecting us, as much of a shield, then that, that, that could damage um, all of these, these, this 
And radiation too, like. And well, some some of the scientists are worried about more radiation getting closer to the surface of the Earth. And you uh, mentioned solar storms. We had a big one in 2012. 2012. What happened? Have you heard about this? No, no I Nobody's, just heard about it. When I nobody's just... heard about this. It's the most fascinating thing. So it goes back to, in fact, there, we've only had two really huge. They call them super storms. Scientists have all these great terms for these things. So we've only had two that scientists know about. Um, one of them was in 1859. It's called the Carrington event, and this was just an extreme. And solar storm just means that you know the 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 the, the sun also has a magnetic field, and sometimes this 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 pulse of you know solar energetic particles, and you know it's just a, this immense amount of energy just just shoots forth and it torrent from the from the sun and, and and hits the earth and one of those happened they happen episodically in my in more minor ways but a real big superstorm the only one that um, hap that scientists had known about um, 1859 was in 1859 it's called yeah. the Carrington event and it just it, it was right as we had just begun to lay telegraphic lines thousands and thousands of kilometers of telegraphic lines across um, across the earth and these telegraphic lines became conduits for you know this extreme, um, this extreme electrical, you know, activity mm -hmm. that the solar storm unleashed, and so they f they burst into flames. They, you know, the, the whole it was just an extremely um, intense event. So the next one, so scientists were saying, well, so when's the next one going to happen? There's got to be another one, and it happened in 2012. Except that the sun happened to be facing away from the Earth when it let loose this huge, big stream. So if it was facing the Earth, it, it would have been facing the Earth. So they did a forensic analysis because, you know, scientists weren't really all that worried about the, you know, what what could happen to the electronic electric infrastructure until they saw this thing happen in 2012 and they looked at it and, and because. It, they happened to have spacecraft that, that were witnessing mm -hmm. this thing. They could track it. It was because it hit that it, because it was facing away, and they had they had spacecraft that were actually monitoring stereo A or something. Yeah, yeah. there's a there's a bunch of stereo. Uh, uh -huh. There were a bunch of, but stereo A was one of them. And so they they could do this really precise forensic analysis of what the energy had been, and then they could you know sort of uh, extrapolate from that and say, okay, if it had been hitting the Earth instead of hitting away, you know, pointing away, we might what, not be, wow. what would have happened? And so they were able to do this whole analysis of what would have happened to the electrical infrastructure and satellites and all these other things that depend on, you know, a stable magnetic field to, to function. What Sounds would happen? Sounds like a science fiction movie. I know, it's bizarre. Yeah. It's, just, it's, most, it's, it's just a fascinating idea, yeah. um, but it's real. And in the book, you speak to uh, Daniel Baker. Yes. And he says that um, another one could happen in eight years. So eight years from 2012? No. How soon can could this uh, happen storm? again? Yeah. It's completely unpredictable because it depends on the volatility of the, the sun's magnetic field and the sun's, the sun's, you know, just whatever happens in the sun, which is we, which we can't predict at all. We have no ability to predict the sun. So basically, we have the storms to contend with, and then the poles, super storms. The super storms. We have, we have so, so the the reason it's it, it's important in this whole t discussion about the reversal of the poles is that when the poles are reversing. The, the, the field that protects us from solar storms is down to 10%. So it doesn't take a superstorm to, to really scorch some of the el electrical infrastructure. It only takes a regular storm because we'll have so much less of a protective shield against it. And that's why scientists are looking at those superstorms. It's like, you know, to somebody like Daniel Baker, he's saying, well, you know, we've built up, he's written papers about this, we have built up this whole electrical infrastructure, our satellites, you know, we've interconnected everything, we've digitized everything, we've miniaturized everything, meaning that they can be more easily damaged by radiation. We've done all of this while the field was relatively strong and stable. And our ability to predict all of these storms, these, these solar storms and galactic storms, galactic episodes, has not kept pace with this incredible interconnectedness that we've built into our grid and into our satellite systems and our dependence on the satellite systems and on the timing systems of the satellites to control things like even, you know, charging up your Tesla. All of that stuff is, has been built up without thinking about what happens when the field is not as stable. Can we do anything to prepare <laughs> for this? Well, uh, you, there, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, already, satellites are what they call hardened, so they're they're engineered to be able to withstand some 
uh, you know, radioactivity from the sun, so sun and ionizing particles and all that kind of stuff. So they're they're already hardened up, is what they, is the term they use. And and there's and it's possible to make them more uh, resilient against against this stuff. And it's it would be possible to, uh, you know, to toughen up some of our grid and our other electrical structures. And some of that is happening, but scientists think it's not happening with enough. Um, Care, urgency or, or urgency with enough knowledge of of the of the implications of this like we do we spend a huge amount of time as modern civil in modern civilization protecting this electrical infrastructure it's it, it's what runs our mm -hmm. you know it's I, I think of it as the sort of the central processing unit of our society and and yet and yet it's at risk in ways that were never imagined when it was built up and so these scientists are saying you know what we have to think about that and a uh, final question, we've run out of time, but um, I was, one of the things that stood up for me in the book was that animals have a sixth sense, yes. uh, sixth sense magnetics, right? So if the poles were to reverse, yes. what would happen to animals? Um, scientists, so when, when the poles are reversing, it's not that we'll have two poles, we'll have four or six or eight poles. And if you're, say, a whale and you need to navigate by a pole, um, it's not exactly clear how you're going to be able to do that. Scientists think that they're going to be resilient. They, they've done experiments, and they think that these that creatures will still be able to figure, the, you know, get to where they need to be, to to reproduce and to eat and all that kind of stuff. What they worry about is that some of the animals that are most dependent on this are also the most endangered. So you've got sea turtles, you've got whales, birds. Um, we've put a lot of pressure already as a human species on many other species on the planet, and if they don't have resilient populations to begin with, are they still going to be able to withstand the rigors of a world that has, you know, a, 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 you know, four or six or eight poles? Lana, thank you so much for being here. I'm putting this uh, top of mind for us <laughs> and for your commitment for writing this book. It's thank something you. that we all need to know more well, about. Thank you very it's much. It's been a pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.